On the literature of the Country House MOOC this week, um, we're looking at Gothic literature and we're looking at writers like Anne Radcliffe um, and we're charting the prog progression of the Gothic from Anne Radcliffe to Charles Dickens. And we're actually joined here today on the blog by PhD student Kathleen Hudson, who's running a PhD about servant narratives in Gothic literature. Can you tell us a little bit about how the Country House figures in your own work and in the Gothic more generally? Well, it's not one of those things that you immediately think of when you think of the Gothic. I mean, when you think of the Gothic, you think of the haunted house and the creepy castle and, and may, maybe some disused convent or something like that. But actually, in many ways, the Country House is can be very Gothic, um, even in not particularly Gothic texts. When you think about it, Samuel Richardson's Pamela has a lot of very proto-Gothic elements to it, deeply connected to its to its identity as part of a country house branch of literature. There's this Byronic anti-hero who um, kidnaps the heroine and takes traps her in his country house, and she has to try to escape and all that kind of thing. Um, so in some ways, that that does draw quite a bit on Gothic literature. Um, but within actual Gothic texts such as Radcliffe, um, there are usually uh, country houses present in the text. They're, they're the places at the very beginning and the very end of the novel, the, the very idyllic, idyllic place where the um, heroine grows up and the place where she ends up at the end when she's reunited with her loved ones and, and all that good stuff. And these places are depicted as very ideal spaces, you know, that this is where the benevolent patriarchy uh, reconstructs a domestic space. And uh, the gothic spaces, the old creepy castles where um, most of the action takes place are sort of corrupted versions of a country house. On the other hand, even ideal country houses can be very subversively gothic. Um, the idea of having servants sort of presupposes that there's an entire branch of maybe possible monsters living under your stairs that cook your meals and, and bring you food when you, when you need it. Um, and also that there is the idea uh, that you can have secrets in a domestic space and that those things can come back to haunt you. Gothic is a word that we're using a lot on the course this week, um, but I wonder if all of our learners know how we're using that. So when we talk about things being gothic, or we talk about gothic literature, the gothic novel, what does that actually mean? Uh, well, it is kind of a joke. It's, it is one of those things that I think, uh, especially academically, trying to define it, it becomes a bit of a trick. It's the joke that you kind of know it when you see it. And um, I think probably many of the people who are participating in, in the MOOC uh, will have certain ideas of, of it when it comes to mind. You know, the, the creepy castles, vampires, werewolves, monsters, uh, mad monks and heroines who faint quite a lot. Um, and the Gothic can have all of those things and none of those things. Mm -hmm. And it can have all of those things and not be particularly gothic or none of those things and be very gothic. Um, from a very strict perspective, uh, the gothic is merely a branch of romanticism that focuses a great deal on t exploiting terror and horror to try to create a sense of a gothic aesthetic. Um, it, it, in, the, in its earliest sort of reincarnations, especially in England, it was an attempt to reevaluate and reincorporate a, a British Gothic history into a post-Enlightenment kind of space um, and sort of justify English history and, and English literary output. Horace Walpole, who wrote the first Gothic novel, openly said that he was trying to create a form that combined um, old Gothic romances, the sort of medieval chivalric romances, um, which were not particularly sophisticated, but which, which represented a very dynamic um, sort of emotional response with the new novel form, which he felt was, was overly realist and kind of dry, but, but which was very effective as, as a form of literature. Um, in terms of what the Gothic says about the country house, it's all about destabilization. It's all about creating a sense of a chaotic um, space where spaces, domestic spaces are complicated, where identity isn't quite what it seems. And this happens quite a bit in negotiations of domestic areas um, and interactions between members of, of families and how they interact with domestic spaces. And would you like to talk a little bit more about your broader project and how servants fit into that? My own project is about servant narratives in the Gothic. Um, I look at authors such as Horace Walpole and Anne Radcliffe, um, Charlotte Dacre, Matthew Lewis. Um, 
And basically I look at instances where servants have to engage verbally in some way with their masters. And usually within these texts, uh, servants perform a kind of mini Gothic tale, if you, if you will. They, um, they tell ghost stories or they remember histories from, from the past and all that kind of stuff. And while many people are, well, while the protagonists are very dismissive of servants as the, oh, you know, you don't know what you're talking about. You're, you're, you're just a servant. You came, you gave me this really weird ghost story about someone who maybe may or may not have died in the room that I'm sleeping in. Thank you for that. Um, and then, and then you just sort of wandered out. But really, it, within these texts, th they have a very fascinating, th they're a very fascinating reflection on the genre because they're structured as mini Gothic tales. So they are a place where you can engage and sort of interrogate why a Gothic tale is terrifying, why it's emotionally relevant. And also on the other hand, they do provide very uh, serious spaces for engagement for the people within the text. Um, for example, in The Mysteries of Udolpho by Anne Radcliffe, Emily St. Aubert, who's the protagonist, is very dismissive of, of people like her maid Annette who will come and tell her oh yes the lady Laurentini she disappeared and no one knows where she went and and she was probably murdered because no one knows where she went um, and Emily is on the surface very dismissive of that and, and sort of laughs at Annette for being so so gullible um, but she is she does react emotionally to it she is scared by that idea and later, of course, in the text, it becomes a very serious issue for her, and she has to then identify the actual lady, Laurentini. Um, and in that identification, she herself rediscovers who she's supposed to be, what her family mm -hmm. is, and, and it has a very real impact on, on her creation of identity. Um, so in, in that, yes, so that, that, that's the very long answer to, to what I do and, and what my project is on, is basically looking at those kind of stories, how they reflect constructions of a larger Gothic narrative. And just before you go, have you got any hints or tips for our learners who are possibly encountering Gothic literature for the first time? I, I'm going to sound very biased when I say that you, you should all read the servant narratives, but you should. It's, it, inter <laughs> interestingly, it, when I started working on this project, I didn't like servant narratives. Those were always the parts in the novels that I skipped because they seemed very tedious. But if you almost read them as individual stories, almost sort of subset stories, um, you can really examine what it is that's effective about a gothic novel because here is a little miniature version of a gothic story. Um, and of course, yes, that within these stories then you have the larger engagements, they, they have a, it's very tricky because they do like to slip really important information into this sort of, oh Lord, there's, there's a ghost, ah, but also here's this very important tidbit that you're going to need to know later. Um, so yes, I, I would read the servant narratives very carefully and read them out loud because they are hilariously funny <laughs> when you read them out loud. So yeah. Excellent. Thanks very much, Kathleen. Join us again on the blog next week where we'll be speaking to another PhD student who's been working in the archive at Renishaw Hall.